You're listening to the Therapist to Millions podcast, where we get under the skin and into the brains of the world's leading therapists with Dr. Susan Spicer and myself, Damian Mark Smith, as we delve into the world of all kinds of effective therapies with fascinating and challenging cases, plus marketing tips and what's really working in mental health right now. Hello and welcome to the Therapist to Millions podcast, where we get under the skin and into the brains of therapists around the globe. And we've got uh, an American therapist today, which means we've had a time change in the UK. And oh my goodness, this is causing absolute havoc and chaos. Fortunately, she was available the hour before, is it the hour after? I can never remember. Anyway, uh, please welcome to the show, Gwendolyn Tuttle, who is a certified mentalization-based therapist and licensed clinical social worker who specializes in treating personality disorders with an emphasis on personality organization systems of attachment. She is currently the clinical coordinator at Cornerstones of Maine, whilst completing her residency in the Doctor of Social Work program at the University of Pennsylvania, where she's studying the impact of race and engagement in psychodynamic therapy. And crucially, Gwen also has dabbled in stand-up comedy. So, (laughs) (laughs) Gwendolyn, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thank you. Good. I'm doing really well. I'm excited to be here. Fantastic. Give us a little bit of a background. How did you get into therapy? I mean, you know, what, what's your story? What's your backstory? Yeah. So, um, you know, I majored in psychology in my BA program. And uh, shortly after that, I really wanted to get into the field. So um, I started working as a case manager for Catholic Charities and um really just kind of started getting really interested in some of the clients that nobody else wanted. Um, And those were clients with borderline personality disorder. Um, So I fell in love with that disorder and just how, um, just how it presented, how difficult the clients were and what they triggered in some of my colleagues that really made it difficult for um, them to really want to treat them and be involved in that. And um, through case management, I was like, oh, I can help a bit more. So I should um, investigate therapy. And I uh, had a great mentor who suggested that um, I pursue higher education. And so um, I obtained my master's degree and have been focusing on uh, mentalization based treatment for personality disorder ever since. Fantastic. You're the second therapist we've had now on the show in a row, who's basically come across some really difficult cases and gone, hmm, I think I'm going to jump in at the deep end. <laughs> Right. A little bit of a masochist in that way. What? Why did I mean, that's that's, you know, that's brave. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I'm going to ask you this, like, you know, now at the beginning, but where does the comedy fit with this? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think the the comedy fits in that um, I I like being a performer and I like everything that's ironic. And there's a lot that's ironic about personality disorder, um, kind of in a sad fashion. But Um, there's just a lot there that I think um, we can make light of and normalize in a way that like makes it palatable to people who otherwise would kind of hold that at arm's length. Yeah. Okay. So now let's, let's dig into some case studies. So uh, let's use hypotheticals and no identifying factors. So give us some examples of success stories, maybe cases that didn't go so well, and then your most unusual or or interesting case. (laughs) Yeah, so um, I actually recently just worked with a young man um, who presented with some pretty significant attachment trauma, um, a difficult relationship with parents in which um, one parent was um, narcissistic and verbally abusive, and the other parent was um, a little histrionic. And what I found is that that culminated in um, some dependent personality disorder traits and actually some OCPD, which Um, is actually one of the more um, frequently diagnosed personality disorders, even though it's one of the lesser known personality disorders. And um, really how that presented was some significant perseverative and ruminative thought about the behaviors of other people in this young man's life. And so he would get really stuck um, feeling like uh, the people in his life didn't care about him or would at some point abandon him And he would like pursue these people via text constantly. Um, If they didn't respond within like 15 minutes, you know, it was all about him. It was like, oh, you know, they don't like me. They're talking about me behind my back. Um, And even with me, you know, even six months in, he's like, you know, Gwen, I still don't trust you, right? I don't have any reason to trust you. Um, Sometimes the things you say really rub me the wrong way. And I don't know how to, you know, I don't know how to make sense of that. 
And so through an MBT lens, we really had to work on epistemic trust, right? Which is like different than normal trust. It's the ability to like buy into what I'm saying as a professional and that my, uh, my instincts are good, that my intentions for him are good. And that the things that I'm saying, the challenges I'm offering are worth taking. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we really had to do a lot of work there just in the room between us to be able to work through the conflict that would arise. And this is actually one of the things I love about personality disorder, which is it's really about the process of what's happening in the room right? What happened yesterday with your best friend, what happened two years ago with your old lover, none of that really matters because what's playing out is what I am evoking in that person, triggering in their attachment system, um, challenging in their sense of trust and their sense of safety right in the room. And so um, we did a lot of bringing it back to that processing. How do you feel right now? Why do you feel it? How is this impacting your behavior? How are you perceiving me? How can you accurately know where I'm coming from? can you trust what I'm saying? Um, And to really work through that. And I was comparing his case actually the other day to um, like climbing Annapurna because it was literally like step by step. Okay, where are we? Let's check the oxygen. Let's like see how we're feeling. And it took about a year, but what we saw is um, a reduction in the perseverative thinking. Um, What we saw is him able to pause and observe his own thoughts and behaviors and then use interventions therapeutically that we cultivated together. Um, And we also saw his ability to trust increase. So by the time he graduated treatment with us, um, he was able to like say that he actually like trusted what I had to say and that he appreciated our time together. Um, And of course, this was a year long journey. So Um, you know, that was really nice to hear at the end of it. But that also um, was evidenced by his relationships that he was able to cultivate with some of his peers. Um, In treatment, he developed some strong friendships, and they all live together uh, now in an an apartment in a different state in the US. That's amazing. It sounds like you really got into kind of slow down his thinking and observe Mm -hmm. it a lot more. Yes. That's really powerful. What's been your most uh, sort of challenging or fascinating case? I, so I worked with uh, people with hoarding disorder earlier in my career, and um, I worked with a woman who um, hoarded rotten food and hair and tissues, Mm. Oh dear! and she was at risk for eviction, so I was assigned to her case, and I walked in, and I thought that maybe her apartment was, like, filled with smoke, because there was, like, a cloud of black uh, everywhere, and I realized that those were fruit flies. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Oh yeah, goodness. it was like it was shocking. I also in, out in the corner of her dining room saw a cat bed, but throughout my time working with her, never saw a cat. And so finally, and I was worried it was going to be like on one of those TV shows where like you find a cat carcass somewhere. <laughs> um, but she, I did later ask her, and she said, "No, that's just something I've kept," which was in line with her hoarding, right? She she had a trauma history, and so I think that the hoarding was a product of. Um, some of that trauma kind of playing out, not being able to feel safe unless she was surrounded by the things that gave her comfort. Um, But we never got into the true ideology of why rotten food, why um, human hair and dirty tissues. (laughs) We were never able to find out kind of (laughs) where that all came from. Um, But we did treat it to help her avoid avoid eviction and be able to maintain her living. Excellent. Well done. That's good. Fantastic. So what's um what's been your your most successful marketing technique in in your business? Yeah, I think that our ability to um use a relational approach and really develop um rapport but really being able to develop a healthy relationship and with the people I work with now emerging adults 18 to 28 um almost reparenting um Something that we also do is we involve parents in treatment. Um, So I do individual therapy, I do parent coaching, and I also do family therapy. And developing that rapport, really being able to um, engage with families that way, be able to recreate structures that are actually supportive and support resolution um, of personality dysfunction, of attachment issues, um, has really served, I think, to create a lot of success for us in what we do. Fantastic. Now, talking about marketing, um... Have you written a book? No. <laughs> okay, right. So if you could write a book, what would the title be and why? Um, I would definitely be talking about personality disorder. I think I would also note the tragedy of um, issues with attachment because what I see is the heartbreaking aftermath of 
um, very, very early attachment being disrupted and people trying their best, both parents and young adults, to try to manage what this has meant in their lives and just the absolute tragedy and the grieving that comes from that. Um, so yeah, I would have to say maybe shedding a thousand tears, <laughs> the, the tragedy of attachment issues and everything that comes after it, but then also the opportunity to move past that and really feel good about um, your relationships. Fantastic. So talking about books, what's what's your favorite therapy book and why? I so I Peter Fonagy is one of my heroes and he's written a lot of books on attachment, but I would say that um one of his MBT manuals actually that he wrote with it, uh Anthony Bateman is definitely my favorite book, only because it really talks about um how epistemic trust and mentalizing are really the cornerstones of all of therapy this is not unique just to mbt you find epistemic trust and mentalizing in dbt and tfp um and cognitive behavioral therapy right it's 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 the underpinnings right of how we create and cultivate relationship um and so i like how he's able to explain it in a way that is digestible for clinicians across their career span whether they're you know new in their first year or in their 30th year it's just very accessible and peter fonagy has an amazing brain he's just able to synthesize um, attachment and make this palatable in a way that gives you the steps you need to be able to maneuver um, through a therapeutic relationship and really see the outcomes that your patients are hoping for. Fantastic. We'll put a link to that in the in the show notes, uh, along with the contact details for yourself. Now, if in your spare time you do read books <laughs> or listen to them, what would be your favorite ever non-therapy book and why? <laughs> Um, so I, <laughs> this is embarrassing to admit, um, but I am a huge fan of L.J. Smith young adult novels. <laughs> I, I was introduced to them in college, and I just think that she's a fantastic writer um, and not a very well-known writer. So not Twilight, but like the other end of that spectrum um, and just the way that she's able to use language to craft uh, images and story. I really appreciate that. Fantastic. Now, what's your top tip in the in the world for mental health uh, at the moment? Um, so, well, so right now um, in my doctoral program, I'm really looking at race and how that is impacting um, the ability to build epistemic trust. Obviously, there's, you know, we see in the media, there's just, um, there's, I think there's a higher awareness of the challenges for people of color, um, particularly in the U.S., but this is also like a global issue. And so um, right now I'm really interested in understanding how colonization has affected um, the way that psychotherapy is delivered um, for populations, both that are white and for people of color, and looking at the outcomes for people of color, because they actually struggle with um, significantly different issues, and actually many of their mental health issues present differently than they do for white people, right? And this is something that's not really accounted for in the literature. Um, it's something that's not been greatly studied. And so I think right now for me, um, being able to understand how that affects the people that I serve that are people of color, but also how they're able to access appropriate services um, is really, to me, the biggest issue right now that we're facing. Yeah, I was listening to a book recently called Sapiens, and it talks about the origins of slavery and about how capitalism basically drove it. And it's um, yes. it's incredible. It's, it's very sad, actually, about how we can still be doing yeah. that as humans. Um, fantastic. Now, I have a feeling I know which one we're going to go for here, but... <laughs> So it's fact or joke time to win a T-shirt, which I'm modeling here. So a Therapist Millions T-shirt. <laughs> can we just ask that when you get it, you can take a photograph of yourself in your T-shirt and send it in. We're going to have a little gallery of all of our guests uh, in their T-shirts. So tell us a fact that blows our mind or please, please, please tell us a joke that's one of a kind. <laughs> um, OK, so um, I'll, do, I'll do a safe one because this is a podcast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Let's see. Uh, what do you call a um, a snowman that crosses the street and has fangs? Uh, has fangs? Don't know. What do you call a snowman that crosses the street and has fangs? <laughs> a snow pyre. A what? Say again. <laughs> a snow pyre. <laughs> it's terrible. Sorry, it's a children's joke. Or <laughs> because we're doing a podcast. <laughs> you can, honestly, I. We have one guest on, and his joke was so rude, I actually had to cut the joke out. I just said we couldn't even put it in there. <laughs> I think therapists have got dirty minds, actually. Right, yeah. Tell us one from your stand-up, and if, it, if it's okay, we'll leave it in. If not, I'll cut it out. 
Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, so one of my jokes is um, when I was a grad student, uh, I was, um, my mom was concerned that I was drinking too much and uh, had talked a lot about, you know, maybe you need to get some help. And I was like, no, I, I don't have a problem with alcohol, right? I only drink because I have to counteract all the Adderall I ate to be <laughs> able to get through my master's thesis and be able to graduate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. That's staying in. But... That's brilliant. <laughs> it's, and it's topical and it's relevant. <laughs> That's awesome. And finally, Gwen, how can people contact you or get hold of you? Yeah. So um I my email address is gtuttle at cornerstonesofmain.com. And um I provide consultation for therapists. I um, I love to teach people about mentalization based therapy. So any questions about that? And I'm also just passionate about emerging adult populations. Um, I've been working with them for over six years. So um, I have some expertise and would love to share it if people are interested. Fantastic. And are you still doing stand up comedy as well? I haven't done any shows since COVID um, that kind of put the kibosh on all the venues um, in Maine. But um, once we're like fully back to normal operating, I do plan to do some sets again. You're going to take your sets out there and practice. I love it. And are they are they sort of mental health therapy based as well? Yeah, a lot of my jokes are about like what, you know, when people come to you and find out you're a social worker, they like, you know, call their nanny and are like, oh, get the kids in the back room. <laughs> like, which one knows where <laughs> bigger kids i'm like i don't want your shitty kids <laughs> <laughs> brilliant and look, i'll put a link to your linkedin as well because there is actually there's a video of you doing some stand-up yes. on your linkedin isn't there so <laughs> wonderful thank you so much for taking this time out and sharing some case studies and some marketing tips and some mental health tips really appreciate you and appreciate what you're doing and uh, thanks so much we'll put all the show notes and the contact details in there thanks gwen for taking part in the show thank you. If you enjoyed this week's episode of the Therapist to Millions podcast, may we invite you to check out our free for life Therapist to Millions online membership course for therapists and coaches who want to grow their business without trading more time for dollars. We've created the world's premier digital marketing resource exclusively for therapists and it's yours for free for life. Just head over to therapisttomillions.com and sign up now.